So, I trust that you guys are blessed, and welcome to week three of our, so I want to wait, before I say that, Maria laughs at me for this, where is she? If I don't see her here, she knows. So, I struggle to pronounce the word Philippians. Philippians. <laughs> it sometimes comes out like I'm saying Philippines, which I'm not really trying to say. So if you hear it that way, know that I'm meaning the book of the Bible, Philippians. <laughs> Philippians. Right, so I'm just putting it out there. Uh, my pronunciation isn't great, so forgive me with that. But once again, welcome. This is our sermon series, and we've been preaching through this book for the last three weeks. This is the third week. And I'm so excited to share with you week three. But just giving you a small recap of the last three weeks, Yaku started off um, when he went into chapter one of the book, and he spoke about how we can have joy through Christ. And he spoke about the difference between joy and happiness, and how sometimes we search after this thing called happiness, but that's so temporary. But the joy that God has for you is something that's lasting. And to seek it, and the only way to get that is through Christ. And sometimes in our lives, we have these things where I'm not happy right now. I don't have joy in my heart. And we, Yaku spoke about, I will have joy when, and he had a dash there. And for many of us, that's a different thing. I will have joy when I'm married. I'll have joy when I complete my studies. I'll have joy when my first baby comes. I'll have joy when I, my company is blooming and everything's going well. But Yaku spoke about how we can only have that true joy through Christ. And last week, Marielle took us to a space where we spoke uh, about joy through suffering. How many of you were here? How many of you enjoyed that sermon? That was a massive blessing in my heart as well. So well done, Marielle. It was a very powerful but very challenging message. It wasn't easy. I think if you really took home what she said, um, your days would have not been normal. You would have really struggled to see, God, am I, one thing she said actually, which still for me, it's, it's are the things you're living for worth what Christ died for? How can you, in my day, I woke up Monday and I was like, God, I really need to now wonder whether what I'm living for even today, is it worth what you died for? But she spoke about suffering, and suffering is not like this amazing word we hear of, and we're like, oh, I want suffering. Give me some of that suffering. It's not one of those things. It's not like a chocolate cake or triple chocolate mousse from Woolworths that we just want. But we hear it in the space where God doesn't want us to search after this suffering. God doesn't want us to long for suffering. But he says when you are in the midst of it, you have a hope. A hope that is found in Christ. A hope that the world can never give you. The hope that happiness can't give you. And that's the joy we're searching for. The joy through that suffering. And that can only be found once again in Christ. And to think of this, for me, it really struck a nerve or struck a thought in my mind where we can't really achieve any of this without a change in our mindset. We can't really achieve this true joy in suffering and this true ultimate joy in Christ without a shift in our perspective. And today, I'm going to be touching a bit on that. So I'm going to be preaching through Philippians chapter 3, and I'm going to be speaking about joy through maturity. And one of the scriptures that I'll be focusing on today um, would be from Philippians chapter 3 and verse 15. But just before we get there, I want to pray. So you can just close your eyes. Lord, I just bring today at your feet, and I bring this word, and I lay it at your feet, God. And I bring each person that's here today, and you know why they are sitting here today. And Father, I pray that you would open up each person's heart, and whatever word that you have instilled today to be preached, that it will be preached. And I pray, Lord, that I will be in submission to you, Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that we will be able to really experience what joy is. And we can learn from this word what true joy actually is, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. So, in the book of Philippians, chapter 3 and verse 15, it has...
has a scripture there, and it speaks. I'm just going to find it here. Let those of you who are mature think this way. And if anything, you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. So I've dropped this right in the middle. It can make no sense right now. Um, but we're going to build up to this space. So here Paul is speaking about, let you who are mature think this way. What way is he talking about? How should we think? What are the things we should think about? And we are going to journey through just this book just to try and, and, and figure that out through chapter 3 and try and see what is Paul actually saying here. So we're going to spend some time reading. There's a, quite a bit of reading happening today. So if you have your Bibles, please, I'll give you a minute or maybe 30 seconds. Turn to Philippians chapter 3 and we're going to read from verse 1 to 11. When I hear pages stop flipping, then I would start reading. Or pick your hand up if you're using a mobile phone. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to read through it. So from verse 1, it says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if any el anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to the zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever I gain, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and, have, and count them as rubbish in order that I might, may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And there's so many things that Paul is bringing up in the scripture that we can touch on right now. And I'm not going to touch on everything, but let's look at the gist of it. Firstly, to give you just some context of this, Paul is in prison, right? And think about it, you're in prison, but the first line of this, he tells them to rejoice in the Lord. So Paul probably doesn't have much reason to be having much joy in his life right now, but he encourages the church to rejoice in the Lord. And what stands out for me in this, that he actually tells them, he's, it's almost like he's, he's emphasizing that I've been, I've been repeating this to you a lot. I've been telling you rejoice in the Lord a lot. But for me to tell you this, it doesn't cost me anything, but it's good for you. It's good for you that I remind you to rejoice in the Lord, remind you to have this joy, because there will always be reason for you not to have this joy. So what happened in, with this church was, uh, the church in Philippi, Paul, Paul and the disciples went there and, and they preached the, the gospel to them and they gave their, their life to Jesus and thus the church started. But when they left, there was this group of people that went in there and they were called the Judaizers. Or I don't know if I pronounce it the Judaizers, <laughs> but to me it's the Judaizers. And these people, what they would do is they would uh, go behind them and say, okay, you are saved uh, through Jesus but you're not totally saved to, through Jesus. You still need to do X, Y, and Z. There's still some of these religious things that you need to do. And one of the things he picks on here is circumcision. He says you can be saved, but you can only be saved once you are then circumcised. So if you accepted Jesus, but you're not circumcised, you're not saved. So he gets to this space and he tells them, uh, if anyone should put confidence in what they've done, if anyone... Of, of these religious people can place confidence in the flesh, it's me. I've done it all. I was a Pharisee. I was a persecutor to the church. 
everything they are telling you to do, I've done it all, but I count it as lost. It's nothing. And he tells them in the space that they should place no confidence in the flesh. And to bring it into our context, how many times do we place confidence in the flesh? How many times do we get into a space where we have this really cool friend and he's the most generous person you know. He, um, he has an amazing job. He speaks really well. He is so gentle. He's so calm. If only he knew Jesus, he would be such a good Christian. <laughs> but that's not the thing that needs to change. You see, we are all of a sinful nature. We are born into this broken world of sinful nature. And it's not the fact, anything that you do in your life, anything good that you do in your life, all of these feeding schemes that we could have done, all of these amazing deeds that we could have done that makes us uh, get into this space of being right with God. It's not that. It's our faith in Jesus alone. So Paul is emphasizing in this that none, you should not place your emphasis on the flesh. Don't place your confidence in the flesh. And I'm thinking of Paul in this time, and I'm thinking Paul was this guy who studied probably really hard, and he got to the space where he was really intelligent, and he understood uh, everything that he needed to achieve. And like the scripture says, he would count himself blameless under the law. But still, he counted nothing to the flesh and how sometimes we do that. And right now, just I want you to think about this. If you just pause and think, where in my life, where in my life have, have I been placing confidence in the flesh? Where in my life have I been trusting my flesh instead of what the gospel is saying. And you don't have to answer that now, but just keep that in your mind. You see, in this space, when, when Paul starts speaking about that, that, that is something that stands out, and then he reminds them. He actually gets to this space where he says, I want to almost remind you what the gospel is. I want to remind you what salvation is. I want to remind you what it means to be saved, that nothing you are doing is saving you. It's the saving power of Jesus that saved you. And I'm also emphasizing this. But Paul takes them to this thing. So why? Don't place any confidence in the flesh. Have no confidence in that. And he takes them to the space of saying, you should believe in the power of the gospel. You should believe that you will be saved just by believing in Christ. And all of those things that you think you want to do to get closer to him will never get you there unless you start there with believing him. And so Paul basically understands justification. He understands the moment I give my life to Jesus, I'm justified. Marielle said it just as if I've never sinned. Um, and he understands that I've been saved. He understands what it means to be righteous with God. But then he brings in this aspect. And he's talking about stuff that we'll go through and suffering that we'll go through. And he touches on it and he brings up this thing which we call sanctification. That's what he's speaking about. He's like, you know that you are saved, but there's a process in your flesh that you need to go through. There's a suffering in your flesh that needs to happen, which is a process of sanctification, which is a process of being set apart to be made holy with God. And the truth is, in our flesh, we can never achieve that on our own. It's only through Jesus. And, he, and we're in this space now where he is emphasizing it to these people and he's telling them, you need to understand that you can't have confidence in the flesh and you need to believe in the power of the gospel. And then he takes it from verse 12 to 16. And we're going to read this now. He says, not that I have already obtained this. I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Another translation says, I press on to take hold of that which Christ has taken hold of me. And brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of you who are mature think this way, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. 
when we look at this scripture, you already see Paul saying, I've told you to do this. I've told you to put no confidence in the flesh. I've told you to just believe that you will be saved through the gospel. But he's also bringing a realistic thing to say that he also hasn't achieved this way of thinking. He still struggles with the fact that he has done things in his life. And, and if you look at the scripture, look, I think it's verse, verse 13. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. Now, why did he mention that? Paul is, is almost hinting to us that there's things in his past that he also gets reminded of. There's things in his past that, that he's coming and, and he's remembering and it's, it's almost like derailing his vision of what God is calling him for. And you see, for us, when I look into the scripture, I find, I just see two groups of people in my mind. And there's the one group of people who say, before I met Christ, and if I look behind, things were great. Things were actually really good. Things went amazingly in my life. Why now when I met him am I struggling? Why now when I'm at this space am I going through all of this suffering? Paul too could have said that. Paul was rich. Paul was intellectual. Paul was this, like he said, a blameless guy to the law. And yet he's now sitting in a prison once he's met Christ. And on the other side of that, you see this other group of people where we've accepted Jesus and we've accepted this call and we know that walking this road might be difficult. We might face some trials. We might face some temptations. But when we walk down this road, we hear these voices in our, hear and in our ears and the enemy comes in and he says, but remember that time you did that. Remember those bad things you've done. Remember that time you uh, said something really bad about someone. Remember that time where you had bad thoughts. Remember that time you've watched pornography. Remember that time you've uh, cheated on your wife or thought about cheating on your wife. That's very harsh, but the enemy will come in and he'll, he'll bring in those things into your ears and those were the two people I'm thinking of. And when you hear those, those lies being spoken into your ears, it's almost like the vision in front of you becomes blur. It's like the focus has been shifted. And here, Paul is almost saying, I know this is going to happen. I know you're going to be reminded of those things that you've done. But press on to the upward call of God. Press forward. Go forward. Because all of those things have been dealt with on the cross. And if you really believe the power of the gospel, everything you've done has been paid for. You have to believe that. You have to believe that Jesus has paid the ultimate price. It's not Jesus has paid the price, but I also need to do this, then I'll be saved. No, you're saved. Settle that in your heart, that you are. Salvation is something that's a gift to you. It's given. A gift is freely given. And when we look into the scripture, Paul is almost like reminding us to look ahead. And sometimes what happens is when you give your life to Jesus, you become so aware of the sins in your life that you notice every one of them and you want to go to Christ. You want to walk towards him. But it's your, it's your past that's holding you back. And you allow it to hold you back. And there's this tension. There's this pull from left to right. And you find yourself being stretched apart. And it causes so much pain in your life. And God is saying, I don't want you to hold on to that. I don't want you to touch or even think about those things that you've done. Or your sinful past. Or, or the sin that you might still be struggling with. Let it go and walk to me. And that's the space where we struggle with. We want to hold on so much to both. And for many reasons. Sometimes what we hold on this side gives us happiness. It's instant gratification. And what we're getting on this side takes sometimes time. And we're not willing to put that time into it. It's a mind shift. 
And there's things in our mind that needs to change in order to get to that space. And when we think about it, it's not easy. It really isn't. But that's also what the enemy wants to plant inside your ear, plant in your mind, that you'll never be able to think this way. You'll never be able to be mature in your mind. And God is standing here today and saying, no, you can. You can do that. You see, how we've got to find a way. How do I achieve this in my life? Because right now, when we look at life, and I got a little illustration there. When you look at your lifetime, right, we all are born and we die. I chose 100. I said, okay, maybe, maybe we'll get there. I don't know. I hope the rapture takes place before that, right? <laughs> so we are born and then we die. And there's these amazing things that happen in our life. Uh, I just chose a few things that I think it's very general. People want to graduate. People want to get married. Those are highlights in your life. And all those green lines that you see in there is every other big thing that you think is a positive and uplifting and celebration that you can call in your life. So we sometimes live our lives for this, right? And then if you move to the next slide, you see those red slashes there. Sometimes there's really crises that happen in our life. There's really bad stuff. Like I remember in 2017... Sinead and I had just got engaged. We were coming from a band practice, and we finished early. I said, let's go for, bat, for ice cream, and we went to Aroma. And driving back, I realized I forgot my phone at Aroma, so I was like, okay, let me turn around. And as we're driving, um, I'm, I was driving fast, unfortunately, <laughs> and... Something tried crossing the road, and I lost control of the car, and the car flipped. It flipped about three times. We landed upside down. I was okay. Sinead's hand was stuck underneath the car. Thankfully, we both came out of that alive. But that was a crisis in my life. That was a moment in my life where I could have been, God, I was doing something for you in that time, but why did you let this happen? I could easily look at the bad stuff and be like, oh, my car was written off. Now i got to get a new car. But I was thankful for life, right? So those red things could be something like that. It could be losing a job. It could be being retrenched. It could be losing a child. It could be having your parents split up. It could be so many things. And we look at this, and sometimes we base our life on this. And you're like, God, I'm going through life. There's these good things going on, but why did this bad thing happen? And it steals your joy. And your thinking is based on almost, I don't want to say earthly things, because that's not it. Your thinking is based on what's happening right now. And for us to truly attain this joy that God is talking about and this maturity in our thinking, when we look in a speck of eternity, your lifetime is only but a dot. And all of those things that you're facing right now would mean nothing one day when you look back. And one day when we are with God and we are rejoicing in heaven and when we are with him singing holy to the king of kings and we think back, oh, why did I spend all that time stressing about something when I could be, when I'm experiencing so much joy right now? And once again, I don't want to make this seem like it's something easy. But there is a space where we got to go to God and say, God, I want you to change my mind. I want you to step in. During the worship, there was a picture I saw of just, <laughs> do you know what a sift is? Um, when you bake, you get a sift, and then it just takes out everything else. So you know that. <laughs> so I just... I saw almost like a sift going through people's minds, like almost like each head. And as it's sifting through, God's pulling out all of those thoughts that are not from him. And he's, he's almost like purifying it and he's leaving the thoughts that he wants in your mind. And you see, this is only achieved once you understand who Christ is 
and what he's done. And just, I just want to almost like land it here and tell you this. When we read that scripture in verse 16, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, only let us hold true to what we have attained. What have we attained? We've attained the price that Jesus paid on that cross. If we are going to try to be perfect in this world, we'll never achieve it. I read something really cool was in this scripture, the word perfect and the word mature is the same in the Greek word, and it means teleos. So it's the same thing. And, and when I read, I was reading my study Bible, and it said, in order for you to truly be mature, is for you to realize that in your physical body, you'll never be perfect. It's for you to know that on this earth, no matter how much you think you are closer to God, you're still sinful. But because we have attained the price that Jesus paid on that cross, because we have attained that salvation, because we have attained this love of God, we can stand here today with a, with a desire to God, shift my mind that I can have joy in the midst of every circumstance I have. Joy in the toughest times in my life. Joy even in the best times of my life. Joy when I'm alone. Joy when uh, my family is falling apart. Joy when things at work are going crazy. It's because my perspective has shifted to what God wants in my life. I'm no longer worried about this timeline that I might have on this earth. But I'm trusting God for what he has in store for eternity. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed today, there is this space where sometimes, and maybe there's people sitting here today, and I want to make this call first. Like you don't know what Jesus did on that cross. You never understood the power of the gospel. You've never understood that it, all it takes is me saying, God, I believe in you. I turn away from my sin and I want to make you Lord of my life. And you found yourself in this constant cycle of life, just struggling with things, not not really finding joy, seeking happiness in other things other than God. And God is here today saying, with his arms wide open, won't you just come home? Won't you just come back to me? And if that's you today, I want you to lift up your hand. And on the other side, there's, I really feel that there's a group of people here today that the thoughts in your mind, the way your perspective is right now, there's, you're struggling to find joy. You're struggling to find it. And you desire it, but there's things, there's just something pulling you back all the time and you want this joy, you are seeking after it. But you just can't get to this space of, of just peace in your heart. And I believe God wants to, to almost give you that joy today. And if you are struggling with this, and if you want God to give you this joy in your heart, if you want Him to, to step into your heart and, and just change even the way your perspective is and your thinking, won't you just lift up your hand? I want to ask if you can please stand. And I think everyone can stand, not just the people who raised up their hand. With our heads bowed, I want to just pray for us. Lord, I just want to pray for each person that responded to this moment right now. Those that are trusting you for joy in their life, no matter maybe what 
those reasons might be for them not to have joy, I pray that you step into that moment and you would give them true joy. Lord, I pray that you would touch them right now from the crowns of their head to the soles of their feet and bring healing into their heart for where they've been hurt. And just touch them in, in the areas where they find themselves just being uneasy, having no peace, having no joy. I pray that you would instill joy within their hearts because your desire for them is to have joy. Your desire for them is to experience this true and lasting joy. And Father, I pray that as they even leave this place today, it wouldn't be something that they were just hoping for now, that they would take that into their quiet times, they would take it into their life and constantly ask you, God, won't you restore joy in my heart? Won't you instill joy in my heart? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can take your seats. I clearly want to just uh, touch on something that Kylan was preaching about, and then um, Kylan's going to take us into just a quick discussion time. But I think if we reflect on the whole series, like so far, we speak about finding joy, and then we speak about um, finding joy through Christ alone, and that's maybe like something like, yeah, okay, cool, that makes sense. And then Mariel comes and says, okay, guys, you'll have joy through suffering. It's like, what? Um, and then joy through maturity. Um, and it was somewhere during this week where I spoke to someone and, and we reflected on, I can't remember where, who it was, maybe it was my wife, but the days when you were like a child, like let's say six, seven years old, um, and you didn't have a lot of cares or worries, like you didn't go to bed tonight like, yes, I wonder if we're going to get paid this month. Um, like those weren't part of your thinking patterns. And in this space we're saying joy through maturity is like, but I don't want to mature. I want to be like a child. I want to be carefree. But one of the biggest differences between maturity and immaturity is the ability to make the right decision. And every single one of us, every day, has the option to make a decision. Every day. You have the option to make a decision or the task to make decisions. And when we speak about this, there's a joy that God has purposed for your life. I want you to know this. Regardless of where you find your life, where you find your life at right now, regardless of some of the stuff that Kylan maybe mentioned, stuff that you're going through or people that you love are going through or what's happening around you in your circumstances, God has purposed you for joy. You need to believe that. You need to make a decision to believe that because um, the enemy also has a plan for your life and that's not to have joy. And he might dis disguise it as happiness, like if you get this, then you will have joy, but he's deceiving you. So you have to make a decision to believe that God has purposed you to have joy. How do I get to this? It's to be born again. To say that the ultimate worth in my life is Christ. And nothing else can compete or compare to the joy of knowing Jesus. The greatest ex um, experience of joy is knowing Christ. And you need to make a decision to believe that. Then, when it speaks about suffering that Marielle touched on, to know that in you participating in the suffering that Jesus has gone through, it says that it's been granted to us. And in the same way as Jesus suffered, he dealt with your sin. He dealt with the, 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 the effects of sin in, in your body and in this world. So when you experience that suffering, you get to remind yourself, this is for the sake of my sin, that I don't have to stay in bondage. I don't need to stay in those past sinful patterns of my life. My life can be different. And then I get to also share the hope of knowing Christ in the midst of my suffering. And we speak about maturity to know that there is a destiny and a calling on your life that God has purposed. And the, the challenging thing is that when God purposes something, He will be committed to it. And you can be committed to something else, but God's going to be committed to this. And then you find yourself in this tug of war. Um, and I know who's stronger. <laughs> God's going to win that battle. But as long as we hold on to the former things, that tension space in the middle is going to feel like you're being punished or that God is basically um, forgetting about you or something like that. But He's calling you to what he, towards what He's purposed you for. And you get to make a decision to say, I'm choosing Jesus. I'm choosing joy. Above happiness, above temporary things, I'm choosing joy. And it comes with a mature mind to forget the former things, to say, 
this is the, this is the, the will of God. I'm going to choose to obey Jesus. I'm going to choose to trust Jesus. But I want you to, to really hear us just throughout these couple of weeks. God's purpose for your life is to have joy. And if you are in Christ, if you are born again, God is going to be faithfully committed to making that purpose come to pass in your life. If you're not born again, then you need to know that God wills for you to be born again. That God desires for you to be saved. God desires for you to know Him personally and intimately. And that is the will of God. And God is faithful towards that which He has promised.